Okay, so this is just a very quick video where I'm going to try and sum up the Hungarian Uprising in about 12 minutes. The Hungarian Uprising is a really important event of the Cold War and one of those hot spots that we have to study as part of the course. Of course, the Hungarian Uprising began in 1956, and we're going to talk about what actually happened and why it happened. To understand why the uprising happened in 1956, we have to wind the clock back a few years to 1953 and talk about the event that really set the whole process in motion. And that event was the death of Joseph Stalin. So in 1953, Stalin died. And this left a gap in the power of the Soviet Union, a power vacuum. To cut a long story short, eventually this vacuum was filled by a man called Nikita Khrushchev. And Khrushchev had some really important differences from Stalin, or with Stalin. In 1956, those differences were really beginning to have an impact on the people of the Soviet Union. But what were those differences? Well, Khrushchev believed that Stalin's style of government was no longer appropriate. He wanted to move away from the things that Stalin had done. So he wanted to move away from the state, the government's use of violence. He no longer wanted to lock quite so many people up or beat quite so many people up or execute and murder quite so many people as Stalin had. He no longer wanted to do that. He also wanted to stop the government from focusing so much on heavy industry, the production of steel and so on. Stalin had done this and it was no longer appropriate for the Soviet Union in the post-war period and Khrushchev wanted to move away from that. This process of moving away from what Stalin had done, the violence and the focus on heavy industry, was called de-Stalinization. In other words, getting rid of the influence of Stalin from the Soviet Union and starting afresh. He's the new leader and he's going to make his own rules. Well, this had some important consequences. In 1956, Khrushchev announced this new policy of de-Stalinization publicly. Well, not publicly, secretly. He announced it to a select group in a secret speech. Unfortunately, that speech was not going to be secret for long. And the contents of the speech made its way out to various leaders around the other states of the Soviet Union. And in Poland, the Polish communist leader got it in 1956 and it is said that he read the speech and had a heart attack and died immediately after reading the contents of that speech. So shocked was he that this new leader was moving so far away from the beloved Stalin. But this also had important consequences on ordinary people in the Soviet Union, not just leaders. So in Poland, ordinary workers began a movement against their government and pushed for some limited reforms. Yeah, certain aspects of democracy and so on. But the thing we're focusing on is events in Hungary. So these happened in the same year, 1956, the year of the secret speech, the year of de-Stalinization, and the year of uprisings happening in Poland. Over in Hungary, the same thing's going on. It began in 1956 with a very important group of people, students. Students began to rise up against the Soviet state in Hungary. Hungarian people had a strong sense of pride in their country and their nation. They were very patriotic. One of the fundamental reasons that sparked the uprising was a general hatred of Soviet control. They did not want to be controlled by the Soviets. They'd already been controlled by the Nazis in World War II. They did not want a new regime repressing them and telling them what to do. So this is one of the key reasons. And the students really took this patriotism and this anti-Soviet feeling and they began to attack certain members of the Soviet state, soldiers and members of the secret police force. And if you research it yourself, you will see that some of those attacks were actually very brutal. They didn't mess around with flyers and flags and silly t-shirts. They got stuck into the Soviet uh, system, right, to members of the Soviet state. So it began with students, but eventually other people began to join the movement too, and it became a much more widespread movement against the Soviet Union. But why is this a problem? Why is the Soviet Union scared of a group of ordinary people rising up against the strength of the Soviet army and the Soviet government? Well, the first leader of Soviet Hungary was a guy called Rakosi or Rakosi. He was a very Stalinist leader, very strict, very brutal, and he repressed the people of Hungary. He was not the kind of guy that really fitted in with Khrushchev's new policy of de-Stalinization. So the people are rising up against Rakosi, there's unrest in the country, Khrushchev needs to deal with it because Rakosi can't, so he removes Rakosi. This is a remnant of Stalin's era. 
They get rid of the Stalinist Rakosi and they put a new guy in charge. His name is Erno Gero. Is he that important for us in the course? Well, probably not, because he doesn't hang around for very long. After a while, it's clear to the Soviet government that Erno Gero can't control the uprisings in Hungary. They aren't just getting smaller, they're getting bigger and bigger all the time and more organised. So Erno Gero is himself eventually replaced. That's Rakosi gone and Erno Gero gone. So the new guy comes in called Imre Naj. This is the new guy that takes over. And the people of Hungary begin to feel that in Imre Naj they've got a new leader who they can relate to. Imre Naj promises some kind of reforms. First among those reforms is freedom of religion to a degree. The people of Hungary were a very religious society. The Catholic Church was very powerful, but under the Soviets, under the Communists, the Catholic Church had been suppressed. Its members had been imprisoned. Imre Naj promised to release, and did release, members of the Catholic Church, very high-ranking ones. He also promised certain freedoms of speech. This was not allowed before. Imre Naj promised these freedoms to the people of Hungary, so they began to get behind him. Eventually, things got out of control, and Imre Naj kind of went too far. It began really when he pressed Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, to remove Soviet troops from Hungary. Soviet troops were seen as a symbol of oppression and violence within Hungary. And Naj knew that they were inflaming, they were really stoking up the hatred against the Soviet Union and keeping the protests going. So he asked Khrushchev to remove them out of the situation. Khrushchev agreed. He wanted to de-Stalinize. He wanted to move away from this use of violence and force. So he agreed and he pulled the troops out of Budapest and out of Hungary. But this is where Naj went too far. He agreed to certain reforms for the people, which were just about acceptable to Khrushchev, until he announced that, the, uh, uh, that Hungary would no longer be a part of the, of the Soviet Warsaw Pact. This alliance of different nations around the Soviet Union who agreed that they would help one another in the event of war, especially in the event of attack from the West, i.e. from America and Britain and so on. Hungary announced that it would no longer be a part of the Warsaw Pact. It wouldn't send troops to be a part of the Warsaw Pact. It wouldn't fund the Warsaw Pact. It wouldn't provide weapons to the Warsaw Pact. And Warsaw Pact army facilities would not be based in Hungary. This was clearly too far for Khrushchev. He could not afford to have a country the size of Hungary, with the resources that Hungary has, leaving the Warsaw Pact. So he sent the troops back into Hungary. In fact, he sent them in with a thousand tanks into the city of Budapest. Eventually, the troops crushed the uprising after some very, very bitter fighting in the Hungarian streets. Finally, Imre Naj was tried and executed by the Soviet government, and a new person was put in charge in Hungary. His name was Janos Kadar. So Hungary went through a whole bunch of leaders in a very short space of time, all as a result of these uprisings that came from the ordinary people who were rising up against Soviet rule, which they, which they really disliked. But what were the consequences of the Hungarian uprising? Why or did they have a massive impact on America and the US and on the Cold War as a whole? Well, we'll look at that. So what were some of the results of the Hungarian uprising? Well, they're not quite as mind-blowing as you might imagine. In fact, they're fairly simple. One of the key results was that Khrushchev realised that there were limits to de-Stalinisation. There were limits to the reforms and the freedoms that he could give to Eastern European countries. The Hungarians had proved that they couldn't be trusted with this freedom to follow the Soviet way, and they had to be crushed. So it proved there were limits to de-Stalinisation. It also, one of the key consequences, is that it helped to really hardened Soviet attitudes towards Eastern Europe. The Soviets, in fact, got a tighter grip on Eastern European countries to stop any uprisings like this ever happening again anywhere else. Poland in 1956 and Hungary especially in 1956 had proved that the Soviets still needed to have a tight grip, a tight control on Eastern Europe. A third consequence is that it had hardened uh, relationships between the Soviet Union and America, but only to some degree. This is a really important thing to remember about the Hungarian uprising. The American president at the time, Dwight D. Eisenhower, was actually 
busy with other things. The world was focused, the West especially, on a crisis called the Suez Crisis, which was a crisis over a canal in Egypt and the supply of oil and so on. So they were preoccupied with the Suez Crisis. But they also did... Another reason why the Americans of the West didn't get involved is that they recognised Hungary as being within the Soviet sphere of influence. They saw it as part of those Eastern Bloc countries that were really under Soviet control and that they had no influence over. They recognised this and so they didn't get involved. Any attempt by Eisenhower and the American government to involve itself in a Hungarian uprising might be seen as an act of aggression and an act of war by the Soviet Union. So they didn't get involved for that reason. And another more human outcome of the Hungarian uprising is that somewhere between 20 and 30,000 people were killed in the fighting with the Soviet Union. This was not some small uprising that happened in a day, made the newspapers and was forgotten about. This was a serious uprising of armed citizens who took to the streets and battled with guns and bullets and petrol bombs against the Soviet Union and 20 to 30,000 of these people were killed by forces of the Warsaw Pact. Which brings me to the last point, one of the consequences, or the two final consequences. One is that it proved the indispensable power of the Warsaw Pact. It was Warsaw Pact troops that went into Hungary to crush the uprising. Don't forget, the uprising had been, in a, in a way, kind of started and spurred on by Nagy's announcement that Hungary was going to leave the Warsaw Pact. This is what brought the troops, the Soviet troops in. So these Warsaw Pact troops came steaming in after Nagy uh, announced this and crushed the uprising. So this really highlighted to Khrushchev and the Soviet Union that the Warsaw Pact was a powerful and in fact invaluable instrument for him to crush uprisings around Eastern Europe as well as to defend against any other attackers. It's a really important consequence. It meant that the Warsaw Pact was going to stick around for a long time. It proved that it was very useful. So this has just been a very short video about the Hungarian uprising in 1956. And hopefully you've been able to get something from it. And you've been able to complete your mind maps based on this topic. And you've been able to consider the causes, some of the events, building on what we've already done, and some of the consequences, especially why the West didn't get involved in this. And hopefully you can remember some of these key words, the Warsaw Pact, sphere of influence, de-Stalinisation. These are all key terms associated with the Hungarian uprising and with this entire period of the sort of early to mid 50s. OK, thanks for watching and uh, good luck. Bye.